Hi, and welcome to another WCT one-on-one -on -one interview. We are very fortunate during this busy time to have Kevin Kruger, who is with the National Association of Student Affairs Professionals, and uh, they're a membership organization that many of you are probably familiar with, but they do best practices in student services. So we're so fortunate that Kevin was able to share some time with us. So Kevin, if you could do a brief self-introduction and then we'll get sure. started. Great. Well, um, hello everyone who's watching. Uh, my name is Kevin Kruger. I'm the president and CEO of NASPA. So as uh, Megan indicated, we represent student affairs administrators across the wide range of institutional sectors, uh, small colleges, community colleges, large publics and privates. Um, and the range of student affairs and student services really is everything from those who serve traditional age college students um, who may be in a residence hall um, to uh, commuter students, first generation students, um, really the wide range of students matriculated um, and um, how we engage them in both student services and student affairs functions. Terrific. Well, what sort of questions are you receiving from your institutions in the midst of this yeah. COVID-19 yeah. pandemic and increasingly as we're moving uh, online and remote for our students as well as our administrators? Sure. Well, I think that, you know, I would break that into like two categories. What's the uh, current and urgent and what are the things that kind of are next up on the list of things to manage? So obviously for, uh, for every institution, current and urgent is how to shift from uh, traditional um, classroom-based education to online. And, and while that's not a student service function, that's clearly taking up a lot of the um, air in the on campuses to how to, how to um, marshal faculty resources and teaching and training resources. Um, I think the second piece is um, uh, current and urgent for residentially based colleges clearly is uh, just managing the mechanism of how we get students out of the residence halls and um, um, and how to take care of the students who um, will fall through the cracks. And I always want to mention this right off the bat, like I think one of the more compelling issues we're facing um, is um, whether you're residential or not is what to do with international students who may not be able to get home. Um, low income students who may have depended on the dining hall or, or other um, food options who now may be increasingly food insecure um, certainly is the option for some students um, who are um, who now become housing insecure depending on what their arrangements are so there's some sort of social service human needs that are immediately have cropped up that we need to pay attention to um, i think the second thing um, that is current and urgent is um, we all know we've sort of talked about the mental health crisis that's facing college mm -hmm. students today um, and that's not just traditional age college students it's graduate students it's adult learners, it really cuts across uh, you know, uh, student body types, um, is how to now manage um, uh, the continuation of care for students who are already in um, uh, seeing perhaps a counselor or involved in some kind of group or something like that. So there are some legal issues that have to be immediately addressed in terms of um, licensure issues. So um, if somebody is in care, for example, um, and they go out of state now, can, uh, you can continue that care for 30 uh, days, but you can't initiate new care if you're not licensed in that state. So, they have, so how do we address the mental health needs of students who now have dispersed um, out of state, for example? Um, that's certainly um, uh, an, an issue. And then the second, second thing is for students who, who have not um, uh, already been engaged in, in a mental health service, this whole um, global crisis is, of course, creating a lot of anxiety for folks who um, are trying to figure out how to struggle with this, particularly, um, um, you know, what, what the day-to-day -day functioning and how do we provide services for those students. So those are some immediate and current things. And then I think we have to look long-term at, at what does this really mean for um, the community of the institution. Um, and we have things like orientation, admissions, commencement, um, uh, academic advising, um, services that have historically have been in person and often, I mean, how do we begin thinking about these um, um, for the future? Uh, clearly, uh, uh, we are already pressed around international student enrollment at many of our institutions, and now with the, the travel bans, how, does, how, do, how do we even imagine an international student coming to the United States next fall is really challenging. So I could go on, but I'm going to let you ask me some questions, but there's a lot of kind of things that we're just trying to wrap our heads around right now to take care of our students in this transition. Right, I'm glad you mentioned the behavioral and mental health component. So that's something that we're working on exclusively with a work group here at WCET, where we're going to pull together some of the, the good practices around yeah. serving students at a distance, uh, whether that's telehealth, and then there's implications around that, like you mentioned the licensure, but also yeah. if you, 
are to do a Zoom consultation right. where where you store that has security right. That's right. Uh, impl right. implications. So we are working to do that. We were certainly sidelined with that work, but there's a, a lot emerging that yeah. institutions are yeah. doing that are very innovative, including mobile apps, um, wraparound yeah. services. But is there a platform that you would suggest that people explore as they onboard these online student services in terms of meeting privacy, security implications? Yeah, yeah. so the first thing, um, and, you, and I think you, you'll uncover this really quickly, you kind of alluded to it. There are, there are um, HIPAA compliant mm -hmm. um, virtual counseling platforms. Um, uh, uh, I know one, for example, called VC. A lot of counselors use VCSEE. Um, uh, Zoom, the standard Zoom that we're using right now is not HIPAA compliant, but Zoom does have a HIPAA compliant um, uh, 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 a, a module. Uh, I think WebEx has a HIPAA compliant module. So uh, your counseling center directors will know this. They'll know which, which are the HIPAA compliant um, uh, services and it may need or may need new, new or expanded licenses, I think for sure. There are telehealth options that um, many campuses were using anyhow. Um, for example, how are they meeting the needs of students who come after hours, for example. Um, uh, and so there are companies that have been doing that kind of work. Um, um, there's also, um, I think what, you know, there's also been an emergence of, um, uh, of commercial solutions for what I consider low level therapeutic interventions, not the really deep kind of, you know, right. needs that students have for in-depth counseling or crisis, but some of the kind of um, maturational transitional issues that students go through. And for those, the, the telehealth options that are out there are really good um, mm -hmm. and have been, I think, been pretty successful. And the counseling center community, I think, has slowly over the years come to a place where they're now embracing those as a additive option, not a subtractive option. Um, so I think all those, are, I think, are in play. I think the most challenging thing is going to be the out-of-state, you know, in the short run now, you know, students, students who are dispersed across the country, how to maintain a continuity of care for them, um, and how do we address students who are now out of state, um, who um, who now have a need for a mental health service, and how do we can engage with them? So it's going to be some uh, figuring out, um, uh, and, and I wouldn't say there's a best practice at this point. It's people are kind of cobbling together solutions, right. um, uh, expecting that back in the fall that we'll back we'll be back to a a standard a model of uh, for at least for the residentially or. or place-based institutions. I do think that this, you know, Megan, I think this is a really good opportunity for um, uh, the, the ongoing conversation about how we uh, need to improve the ways in which we um, uh, are addressing the needs of traditional online learners in general. So everybody's an online learner now, but, mm -hmm. but a month ago we had, um, you, know, uh, you know, huge cohorts of institutions that were serving online students who study online exclusively. And, um, and I think that that is a, um, uh, the need to expand and improve student services for those online learners will help us in these kind of crisis situations when we have to port our students to an online environment in the future. Right, and uh, in terms of telehealth and, and online behavioral health services, there is a compact model similar to the state authorization compact in CSERA. And it, there's not a whole lot of involvement, but I'd like to see us mm. as an organization get behind that yeah. and see if we can onboard yeah. more yeah. organizations and states yeah. so that you can yeah. serve students across state lines. So you know, another, one of those things that comes out yeah. of an emergency that could be really beneficial. Right. Exactly. I, I totally agree with that, yeah. You know, another thing we didn't kind of touch base on, which I just want to mention also, is um, for graduating seniors um, right now, um, uh, whether they have been uh, online or not, um, we are moving into this really critical career services, career placement um, mm -hmm. function. And, um, and that is, you know, look, we already know that historically, we, we are, um, over the last few years, we're trying to, the campuses are working, trying to improve that function in general. Um, but I think now we are, you know, how do you help students, um, you know, engage with the, um, uh, with the, with the, with the workforce uh, remotely now when the career service office is so I think that I think there's an immediate need to kind of ramp up some sure. coaching models I think probably um, for students now um, to, uh, who are graduating seniors who are in this space of not having to connect with the with the workforce um, I think sure. that's an important issue that we um, and then in general I think what we know from the online world and students who are online entirely is that um, um, they uh, off they will express that their needs aren't necessarily getting the job it's career exploration and so this is also going to think for our freshmen or first-year students second-year students or early 
early career students, um, connecting them to career exploration resources early, I think it's going to mm -hmm. be in an, an online format, it's going to be another important thing for us to do. Right, right. This is a great opportunity for someone to develop an online career fair. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Well, I think those do, some of them do exist. I think, um, you know, a lot of campuses have used like sort of online toolkits for students, um, uh, online students to, to use for um, that career exploration process mm -hmm. and paired with some coaches, for example. I think that's um, uh, a, a, good, a good practice that I think we're seeing more of, but we need to expand those practices. Great. And in terms of reaching our students that are now distributed, yeah. what are some of the best communication mm -hmm. methods that you've seen out there? Yeah. How do we reach so, these students? Yeah. So this is going to, this is a, this is the part where we're, we're not ready to go yet. This is going to have to be developed. Um, I think we can take um, a lesson from how alumni offices have engaged alumni and geographically. So um, I think that uh, um, uh, students, um, who historically have been on campus still will have a need to connect with each other. Um, and I think um, social media is clearly going to be the space for that. Um, I mean, obviously, email communications will be one mechanism, but I think setting up perhaps regionally based um, or, or, or academically based or other sort of um, slices of um, social media groups and then letting students engage with each other, this it also could be faculty and staff who engage with them in that space, I think is going to be more and more important. There are some good examples of how this has worked already. Um, but it tends to be more in the alumni space than it has been in mm -hmm. the current student space. And I think this is, um, you know, again, a place where the um, students, uh, particularly anybody in the sort of 18 to 26, 27, 30, are used to engaging in that social media space. So we just have to get ourselves organized and get students into those spaces um, so they can begin having those kind of dialogues. It can be very isolating for a student who has been, who has been used to a the classroom environment to suddenly be, um, you know, kind of at home, uh, facing no easy way to connect. So, one way to connect clearly, I mean, through the classroom um, LMS systems themselves, up clearly is, a, is an important way to do that. Um, uh, we'll have to get faculty who are not used to that way of engaging, uh, how to engage with students. But I think offline um, in a non classroom environment is where we need to beef up our social media presence. Um, uh, and just start experimenting um, and getting students engaged. Um, we've certainly seen this in the higher ed community. I mean, for example, the Chronicle of Higher Education created a Facebook group for folks uh, who are interested in talking about COVID-19. I think they had 15,000 people sign up in like a, a three days. Um, that's, yeah, that's a kind of, that, that kind of initiative, I think, creating some spaces using existing technologies is probably what we need to do. I think that's a really good reminder. We're being hit with all these messages about social distancing, but really, in a time of heightened anxiety and insecurity, yeah. I think these communities are vital. So yeah. Balancing yeah. social distancing and avoiding isolation mm -hmm. simultaneously. Right. right. And I think, you know, and, you know, just like we're doing right here, I think this kind of the video technology, um, you know, in the uh, ubiquitous nature of it now allows us to, to create some spaces where students can connect with each other um, and, and maybe to have that be facilitated by a coach or mentor or a faculty member or a staff member. But it's going to take some more, you know, we, so we have a lot of people now sit on campus who are providing critical services to the infrastructure of the institution. Um, we have faculty engaged in learning, um, but we now have folks who, you know, uh, once, the, once we get through this early period of crisis, maybe we can be um, repositioned or reallocated their time to some different kinds of activities that might be connected to some of their online learners. So, you know, for example, I mean, you have, let's take a traditional residence hall. You have a residence hall director who doesn't have a group of students in their hall now. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a way to virtually connect with them. Maybe there's sure. a way to, you know, and we can think about similar activities for academic advisors and other staff who maybe don't have now people coming to their offices. Sure. Yeah, I think in this type of crisis, a lot of creativity will emerge. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. One of the big concerns in our community is once we move these courses online, which they're not online courses, it's re right. essentially it's remote teaching. Right. But what, what are some accessibility, good practices. I know that the U.S. Department of Education came out with some guidance this morning, but what are you seeing? Are, are you encouraging accessibility offices to stay open so that they can provide support to faculty? Um, yeah, well, again, this, it, it's, having any office open today is a, is a challenge given mm -hmm. some of the guidelines that we're seeing coming through the CDC. So um, I would, I think we should be cautious about, I mean, all campuses are being cautious about what's open and, and not putting staff at risk. Having said that, um, 
there are easy ways to make our accessibility offices available to faculty who are struggling with or new to this environment so that we can address those issues. Um, there's also a whole set of policy issues here that we need to address that, that are in, in process right now um, that allow, the, um, that allow um, uh, not to penalize students who, uh, to, who are now moving into an online environment um, where the Department of Education might have had pro prohibitions about that earlier. So I know there's some, there's some expansion of those kinds of things as well. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, you know uh, the, it's, it's, it's clear that, in, you're right, in this sort of remote teaching environment right now, um, it, uh, some, I, we know faculty are struggling with this, but so are students um, um, who are struggling. You know, I, I'm going to use a personal example. My daughter is a bioengineering student, a uh, freshman at the University of Maryland, and she's taking a class that was in, intended to, um, uh, was a, an engineering class where they're going to build a robot. Um, and so how do you build a robot and a team remotely? Um, and, and she's real anxious about, you know, how is she going to do, how is she going to perform when she's not used to taking online classes? And so, you know, all that I think is important um, uh, to, for considerations, but, but for, particularly from a learning um, disability standpoint and um, being attentive to um, those accessibility issues is going to be really, really important. Great. And are there student services that tend to get overlooked in a situation like this that we need to be aware of? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I mean, I, we currently have talked about the mental health professionals particularly. Um, I think that um, uh, the, um, there's a whole um, range of folks who still have to come to campus to keep the place running. Um, I think about all the auxiliary services that are there. So, I mean, that's a Kind of behind the scenes the campus isn't closed it's just that people it's not students there but we have people who are managing keeping the residence halls you know you know clean working in the student unions um you know dining services for example there are places there are campuses that they may have closed their residence halls but they might have a section of the residence hall open for right. students who are housing insecure or international students they might have a section of dining services open so there's still things happening and i think we should not we should be attentive to the fact that we that we still have people coming to campus and um, having to keep the place uh, operating. Um, we're not completely closed, even though we've gone remote uh, to teaching. I, I also I, think that, you know, I think well, the other thing is that, that not everyone has closed everything. So, um, you know, while we probably, I don't know, we probably nationwide are almost all online at this point, we're not, not every campus has made a decision to stay online for, for the entire semester. So I think that there, we have another wave of decisions that are gonna come might be online for two weeks, but then the campus will have to reevaluate what the rest of the semester looks like. And obviously we have campuses in the quarter system, which actually will extend a little later. So we have to think about, there's a lot of diversity of how campuses are dealing with that. So, right. um, and how they're managing some of that. Right, and each institution from the very beginning, which seems like months and months ago, but really is about two weeks ago that the know. institution started to move online is yeah. we've said, you have to do what's best for your community, follow yeah. the guidance of your, local right. and state government and really really consider what's best for the students because not right. everyone That's right. has access to the resources right. they need including wi-fi which we talked about earlier bandwidth is going to be an increase right. in exactly well, yeah i think the last thing i would just you know one of the last things i would say is the just um, for any senior administrators who are watching this um we know this has been an exhausting um uh, uh you know a couple of weeks Every vice president, every cabinet member, every college president I've talked to has been, I mean, it, it, when the news changes on the hour, trying to make the right decisions and, turn, and basically pivot your entire institution in a different direction is, uh, is, is also um, exhausting. We've been paying a lot of attention to sort of helping our members think about self-care. Um, I think it goes for faculty and staff and student services folks, all of them. Um, in the midst of these crises, you know, making sure you can, you know, make it through yourself, which means taking care of some of the um, those issues. Yeah, and I will echo that. I, from a student services background, they're not always the best at self-care. They're very giving by nature, and I think this is such a time where things aren't normal. You know, we yeah. we have dogs in the background, and we have kids running around right. trying to That's right. That's right. get restructured to remote learning, right. so I think we all have to be That's right. cognizant that things aren't normal, and it's not business right. as usual. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think you're right. And and um, the variety, you know, we want. I mean, we, we of all places want to think the humane places. Um, that you, you mentioned dogs and kids, but you know, uh, I've I've been on calls all morning with staff whose um, whose kids now are home. Um, they mm -hmm. have no daycare. 
they, the schools are closed and they still have to work. Um, and so we're, we get used to having a, a, a Zoom call and sometimes kids come into the, and, mm -hmm. and we should, as supervisors and leaders, we should model that that's, that is acceptable in this time of crisis. It may not be a, you know, long-term future, you know, uh, solution, but in the short term, we need to be humane enough to allow people to stay in, in those environments and do the best that they can. Right. Well, we really appreciate your time. I know yeah. we've taken up plenty. Do you have any last no. words? Well, I just, uh, you know, I, I, what I've say uh, to my staff and to my members, um, you know, and this is, may sound trite, but we will get through this. And I think what you said earlier, I mean, we, there's lessons here for us that will serve students um, for, for the next decade um, because we are moving increasingly to obviously to online learning as a mm -hmm modality and more and more students are engaged in online learning and we'll, and how we um, some of these lessons will help us just get better at that um, and increase our muscle around uh, effective teaching and learning in that space and that will be a good thing for higher education right right and at the end of the day we're all here to serve students so. that's right exactly. that's what it comes back to you well Kevin I really appreciate your time My thank pleasure. you and and stay well yes same to you take care now bye-bye thank you